This video provides science-based advice on an important question for code enforcement and investigations of dampness and mold in buildings. How much is too much? I'm Mark Mendel, an epidemiologist. And I'm Rachel Adams, a microbiologist. We're in the indoor air quality section of the California Department of Public Health. There are four goals of this presentation. By the end of the video, we hope that you will know the indicators of dampness and mold in buildings that scientific studies have linked to health effects, know the underlying cause of all mold problems in buildings, know why you should be skeptical about making and interpreting mold measurements, and lastly, understand the important public health benefits of enforcing for mold and dampness in housing. When we say dampness or mold, we mean dampness or moisture in a building and the resulting microbial growth. We focus here on a specific type of microbial growth in buildings, that caused by fungi, also called mold or mildew. Mold is everywhere, but in a dry, undamaged building it will not grow. Moisture in a building can be unintended or intended. Unintended dampness or moisture in a building can be from a one-time event like a flood, recurring events like leaks during rainstorms, or persistent problems, like a slow plumbing leak. Intended moisture in a place like a bathroom or kitchen, if not properly managed, can still cause mold growth. Why do we care about dampness and mold? Because observed dampness and mold in buildings indicate increased risk of adverse health effects. Dampness and mold are consistently linked by a large body of scientific research to many respiratory health effects. Research findings have linked 10 to 20 percent of current asthma to dampness and mold in United States homes, and a review found that eliminating moldy materials and moisture in homes improved asthma outcomes. A dry home without mold growth is essential for housing habitability. This is reflected in the California Housing Code, which includes both dampness and mold as conditions that can make housing substandard. Dampness, mold, or other conditions make housing substandard if determined by a code enforcement officer to endanger the health of occupants. While dampness has been included in the statute for a long time, the specific condition of visible mold was added in January 2016. There are four indicators of dampness and mold that scientific studies have clearly linked with increased health risks. These indicators, all determined by careful inspection, are visible mold, mold odor, water damage, and visible moisture. It's important to note that these are based on building inspections, not on measurements of mold. We'll get into the limitations of measuring mold later. Other indicators of dampness in mold may also be useful, but don't yet have the same level of scientific support. The presence of any of these dampness indicators is linked to increased risk of adverse respiratory and allergic health effects, including developing new asthma, asthma episodes or exacerbation of existing asthma, respiratory infections, and respiratory symptoms like wheeze and cough. Code enforcement officers may not appreciate how strong this evidence is. It's very strong and very consistent. Note that these indicators consider both mold and moisture. There's a reason we always link these two together. And that's because mold will not grow without moisture. Mold needs a certain amount of moisture to grow, and a normal building surface will not provide that moisture. For mold, a normal building surface is like a desert. So mold will only grow if excess moisture is present. Mold in places that are not intended to be wet indicates a moisture source that should not be there and may indicate a leak through a roof or wall or from plumbing or another source of moisture. Remember, even if you are uncertain about siting for mold, the presence of mold may trigger parts of the housing code that deal with dampness and moisture. This may also be helpful outside of California where mold may not be included in the housing code. An exception is surfaces that are intended to be wet, such as showers and sinks. Although these surfaces are designed to be smooth, non-porous, and easy to clean, they can still grow mold if not frequently cleaned, especially on grout or other rough areas. When you see or smell mold, think moisture. Given the strong links between the four indicators of dampness and mold and health risks, can we set specific limits for the amount of observed dampness and mold in buildings? No, we cannot now specify 
a specific amount of dampness or mold as a maximum acceptable limit. However, the scientific research tells us the more dampness or mold observed or smelled, the greater the health risks. In one study, a small area of visible mold or water damage about the size of three sheets of notebook paper was linked to large increases in breathing symptoms. Mold odor stands out in studies as the indicator of dampness and mold that is most strongly associated with health risks, so pay close attention to it. A moldy or musty smell may tell you about hidden mold and moisture that needs to be fixed. Buildings can even have invisible moisture with no mold smell. Use of moisture measurement tools at sus suspected areas of hidden moisture may be able to detect this. There are public health benefits to enforcing for mold and dampness, even without clear guidelines. Code enforcement officers often have to make decisions without clear thresholds and without a standardized building investigation checklist. These limitations lead some agencies to simply avoid enforcing for mold and housing at all, or may refer tenants elsewhere to offices with no enforcement authority. However, there is a real public health need for diligent enforcement of mold. Dampness and mold, which are common in California, are even more common in rental homes and low-income homes and minority homes. As we noted earlier, remediation of dampness and mold has been documented to improve respiratory health. If code enforcement officers would enforce for mold and dampness, it would reduce the burden of disease, especially in low-income and minority populations in California. We do not recommend that measuring mold be part of code enforcement decisions because measuring the concentration of all molds or of specific species of mold has not been consistently related to negative health effects. For example, taking an air or dust sample within the building and analyzing it for spores counted under a microscope or for what will grow on culture plates or with DNA assays such as quantitative polymerase chain reaction, also called qPCR, None of these has been demonstrated in scientific studies to be a consistent indicator of adverse health risks. In particular, the US EPA does not recommend testing for mold using qPCR because this analysis has not been validated as a reliable way to tell you if a home is unhealthy. Thus, it is still a research tool not yet ready for making decisions about health risks or building dampness. In fact, we do not know what specific microbial agents actually cause the health effects related to dampness in buildings, so we don't know what microbial agents we should be measuring. Currently, these gaps in our knowledge mean that we cannot yet set a specific amount of mold or any microbial product as a maximum acceptable level of exposure in buildings. Understanding effective remediation of dampness and mold is a critical but complicated part of code enforcement. We are not going to discuss specifics on effective remediation, but here are some general thoughts to consider. There are many possible current moisture sources in buildings, each requiring a different solution for eliminating the moisture problem and remediating the damp and moldy materials. Also, past floods or major leaks may leave residual mold growth, now dried, that still requires cleaning or material removal. Here are our take-home points for code enforcement and building investigation related to dampness and mold. Number one, inspect for observable indicators of excess moisture. These are visible mold, mold odor, water damage, or visible moisture. The more of any of these, the greater the health risks. However, there is no known threshold of a maximum safe amount of any of these. A second set of key points, focus on moisture as the key problem that needs to be fixed. The moisture source must be found and remediated to protect health. Building materials that are moldy or wet also need to be cleaned or dried or removed. This depends on what the material is. Porous materials that are moldy or wetted for a long time usually have to be removed. If the moisture source is not fixed, the mold will return. Note that in the left picture, moisture is apparent. Whether the discoloration on the ceiling tile is mold or just a stain, the moisture is still a risk and its source needs to be remediated, that is, fix the leak. The porous ceiling tile also needs to be replaced since it's been wetted. In the picture on the right, visible mold is apparent. Even though moisture is not apparent, there must be moisture there. So here again, the moisture source must be identified and fixed and also the porous moldy material replaced. A third key point. 
We do not recommend making mold measurements and we advise skepticism of mold measurements because interpretations of these numbers are not based on scientific evidence. These measurements have not been shown to be useful in guiding actions to protect health. And our last key point, enforcement for mold and dampness would reduce the burden of disease in low income and minority populations. We understand that code enforcement officers would like to have clear, unambiguous thresholds for making enforcement decisions about dampness and mold in buildings. Although the current science doesn't yet provide these thresholds, we hope that future scientific studies will fill this gap. Meanwhile, we have summarized the best science-based advice available on investigating dampness and mold in buildings, and here are the four main points we want to leave you with. Look for indicators of excess moisture. Remember that moisture is the key problem that needs to be fixed. Be skeptical about mold measurements of the type or amount of mold as they have not been shown to be useful in guiding health protective actions. And keep in mind the important public health benefits of enforcing for mold and dampness in housing. To wrap up, many of the slides list their sources of information at the bottom, and here is the compiled reference list for the entire presentation. We're also posting these slides on the Indoor Air Quality section webpage on mold where you can find direct links to these references. Thanks for watching.